tonight and visiting uh, from other churches. Thank you for supporting us here tonight. So appreciate you all, Brother Nathan. Thank you, brother. I appreciate, again, the opportunity to come and to preach the word for you. Um, I love your pastor. He's one of my dear friends. And um, the older we get, Brother Cal, um, the fewer friends it seems like we have, but the ones that we do have, we cherish even more. And um, your pastor is one that I count as my friend, and I appreciate the opportunity to come and to preach. And I believe God has something to say to us again tonight from his word. Um, with music like we've already had and worship, it's been worth coming. Amen. Amen. God is here. How many of you know we serve a big God? Well, we serve a great big God. I mean, we can't even begin to describe how big and how awesome God is. And yet, as big and as awesome as he is, he cares about us as individuals. That blows my mind. And he cares about what's going on in his house, in the church. He cares about what's going on at your house and my house. And so... Um, I believe that God has something he wants to say to us tonight. I really felt led and burdened um, to give a word for our homes tonight. I believe if we're going to have revival, it, it's not just something we do, not just something we go to. It's something we experience every day of our lives, and I believe it's something that God wants to bring to our homes as well as to our churches. And so um, be turning to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, it's in the Old Testament. Um, right after the book of Ezra, if you're wondering how to find it, if you don't have tabs in your Bible like I do, um, open to the middle, that should be Psalms, turn left and hope for the best. But anyway, um, once you have Nehemiah chapter 4, I'm going to ask that, um, I know we've been standing a lot, but I'm going to ask that we stand in honor and reverence of the Word of God tonight. Um, in the book of Ezra, they stood for eight hours as the law was being read, and so I won't make you stand that long. But um, anyway, Nehemiah chapter 4, beginning at verse 13. Therefore I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and notice this, fight for your brethren. Fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing. How many of you know God's able to bring the plots of the enemy to nothing? When God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, every one to his work. Also want to remind you of what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 and 4. He said, though we walk after the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Lord Jesus, thank you for the promise that your word won't return void. Lord, thank you that your word is just as relevant today as it was thousands of years ago. When it was first spoken and revealed to Nehemiah. Lord, thank you that you have something, a right now, fresh, relevant word for us tonight. Lord, I just pray that you would bring revival in this place. Yeah. Lord, revive our churches, revive our homes, revive our community. Lord, we give you all the glory and all the honor because you're worthy tonight. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen, and you may be seated. As we continue these nights of revival, I want us to see the need for revival, renewal, and spiritual warfare in the home. How many of you know that it's a battle to live for Jesus? It's a fight every day that we get up and we have to put on the whole armor of God so that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. And I've found oftentimes that where the devil wants to attack first is in my home with either in my life or the life of my wife or my two boys. He oftentimes, if he can't get to me, he will get to one of them because he is always as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. In our text tonight, we find the enemies of God threatening the people of God. 
They're trying to keep them from building the wall that would protect them from their attacks. The walls have been broken down. The protective hedge has been lowered, and the enemy is threatening them. And Nehemiah tells them, as he's leading them in this great effort to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, he tells them to take a, to take a building tool in one hand and a sword in the other. Because there is work to be done to build this wall, but you always have to be on guard lest the enemy come in whenever you're least expecting it and attack you and you not be able to finish the work that God has called us to finish. As they're threatening the people, Nehemiah tells the people to take heart, to not be afraid of them, to not listen to what the enemy has to say, and instead be ready to fight for their families. Tonight, I'd like for us to focus on that thought for a few minutes and unpack the truth of what it means to fight for your family. Now, if we're going to fight for our family, we have to realize, first of all, that we're in a battle. We are in a battle for the home. The home throughout history from the beginning when God saw that it was not good that man be alone and created a helper fit for him uh, from a rib from his side and brought the woman unto the man and he said, therefore whatsoever God hath joined together let not the hand of man put asunder. From the beginning the basic unit of society and where God begins to work first is in the home in the family, and the family is under attack. In America, the family is under attack. You say, how so? Well, the definition of a family is under attack. We now believe in our society that two men or two women living in perversion is a family. We think that one man with several sister wives is a family. We think that several men and women living in a communal relationship is somehow ordained of God as long as those people love one another. But God still says that a family consists of one man and one woman for one lifetime, bringing up children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. God's word is not going to change. God's word says what it says, and I believe God's word tonight. And I believe it is right. I believe it is helpful. I believe that when we do things according to the word of God, God blesses us. And when we do things apart from the word of, from the word of God, instead of the blessing of God coming on our lives, instead we have a curse come upon us. Moses, after giving the people the law, he said, I set before you this day life and death. Choose life that you and your offspring may live. May we choose life according to the word of God. But the definition of the family is under attack. Also, the purpose of the family is under attack. Some say it's to make money, win awards, bring glory to self. Others say it's a partnership 50-50. But God says that a true marriage and a true family is a covenant to show the picture of Christ's relationship, love, and faithfulness to his bride and our submission to and love for Jesus Christ. You may not realize this tonight, married couple, but the world is watching you. And if, especially if you're a Christian married couple, they are looking at your life. They're looking at your relationship with one another. And somehow God is going to use that to be a testimony to him when we are in submission to one another and submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet in our day and time, parents are at odds. Children are rebelling, lost, and discouraged. Fathers are absent and mothers are worn out. The devil is deceiving our kids and the foundations of truth, justice, family, and the Bible are being destroyed. And the psalmist said, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The family is under attack. Satan would love nothing more than to drag your marriage through divorce court. He would love nothing more than to take your kids who you have brought up in church and, and sow seeds of rebellion and doubt in their heart to where they take to where they turn away from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. He would love nothing more than to destroy your family and mine. The family is under attack. Satan has declared war on the family. 
And as a result, the walls are crumbling. Just as in Nehemiah's day, the thing that broke Nehemiah's heart, the thing that burdened him was he saw, he saw the city of Jerusalem, the city of God, and the walls were broken down. And the walls were crumbling, and he went before the king and asked for him to, to help him to rebuild the walls. And the king financed the rebuilding of the wall. I'm glad that God still finances the rebuilding of the wall. Amen. The king that is above every king. The king that holds the heart of earthly kings in his hands and as rivers of water turns them whithersoever he will. He is in the business of financing us rebuilding the walls in our communities. But the walls are crumbling. Divorce is an epidemic. Let's be honest. Uh, these statistics I'm going to give you tonight are a little bit old now. They're a little bit dated, but I'd say they're probably a little bit worse and not better. Someone gets divorced in America every 10 to 13 seconds. 50% of marriages end in divorce. 73% of third marriages end in divorce. And Arkansas and Nevada have the highest divorce rates. So what's that tell us? That tells us two things. Practice doesn't make per perfect, and don't get married in Arkansas or Nevada. Amen. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Divorce is an epidemic, and fatherlessness is increasing. According to an article about a decade ago now, from 2002 to 2012, the number of families increased in America by 160,000. But the number of two-parent households where there's a father and a mother decreased by 1.2 million. 15 million, one in three in the U.S. live without a father and five million without a mother. In 1960, only 11% of children lived in homes without fathers. Con and one article concluded that all pathological behaviors can be traced back to the role or lack of role of the father in a child's life. As a school teacher, I see it every day. The effects of fatherlessness. Thank God for the godly men who take it upon themselves to be father figures to those that don't have fathers. And praise God for them. But friends, that's not going to replace the father in the home. God has get placed fathers in the home. And I, I am a father, so I'm going to preach to me tonight as well as to you. We are hurting in America. Our children are hurting because fathers are absent. Sometimes we are at home, but we're not at home. Can I get an amen or an oh me? Sometimes we can be present in the room and not present, knowing what's going on in the lives of our children. Our children are hurting. How do you know this? Because suicide is the leading cause of death for ages 10 to 24. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for college-age youth. More teens die of suicide than from cancer, heart disease, AIDS, birth defects, stroke, pneumonia, the flu, and chronic lung disease combined. Let me say that again. Well, I won't say it again because I can't read all that. <laughs> combined. Let that sink in for a minute. Four out of five teens who attempt suicide have given clear warnings. Many of them are cutting, and many, if not most, are depressed. Others are turning to substance abuse and sexual experimentation. When I was pastoring my first church, I was pastoring this little wide spot in the road called Morrison, Tennessee. How many ever been there? It's halfway between McMinnville, and that's how they say it in Warren County. McMinnville and Manchester. And God called me there, and all that was there was Prater's Barbecue and a carrier plant. <laughs> but when I was pastor of my first church, Warren County, Tennessee, led the nation in teen pregnancy, drug addiction, and attempted suicide. Our children are hurting. And we are looking to everything and, and everyone to solve the problem. Yeah. But friends, there's only one that can solve the problem. Right. 
and he's the one that thought of the home. And when we do things his way and we call upon him and we do what he has commanded us to do, he can restore our homes. He can restore our children. He can turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. Hallelujah. What is the solution tonight? The solution is to do here what Nehemiah said. And he said to fight for your families. I am calling to arms all the fathers tonight in the spirit realm. I am calling to arms the mothers and the grandfathers and the grandmothers. It is time that we suit up, that we put on the armor of God, and we begin to fight for our families. The devil has had free reign for too long. It is time that we be men and women of God. It is time that we quit cowering down in a ditch and we be the church of the living God, the blood-bought bride of Christ, the saints of the living God, the army of the Lord in America again. Hallelujah. Fight for your families. Put on the whole armor of God. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Take the shield of faith, wherewith you can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Not just some of them, but all of them. Satan does not have a fiery dart that can overcome our faith, because this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Hallelujah. Brother Nathan, when you see things crumbling out there in society, what are you going to do? I'm going to keep on believing when you see your children starting to stray and getting away from the Lord and the foundation that you've tried to lay in their life, what are you going to do? I'm going to keep on believing that if I train up a child in the way he should go, when he's old, he won't depart from it. Hallelujah. I'm going to keep on believing that the Bible is the Word of God. It's not just partly the Word of God. It is all the Word of God. Hallelujah. It is true for everyone, in every place, everywhere, no matter of their upbringing. It is absolute truth. And I can trust the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Hallelujah. That's not just a Sunday school song. That's a right now song that the church in America needs to stand on. Hallelujah. It's right on how to be saved, and it's right on how to build your life and your home. Because except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Amen. Fight for your families. Pray without ceasing and build an altar for your children. In the book of Job, we find Job going out every day and building an altar for his children. I ask you, do you really pray for your kids? I know we all pray for them when they get out there. When we go into the bedroom of our teen and we find things, can I get an amen? Because we parents like to snoop, amen? Yeah, we need more nosy parents, Amen. Oh, well, I don't, wanna, I don't want them to not like me for, and be their parent. Yeah. 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 Amen. Amen, brother. <laughs> Go to war in the heavenly realm. Get sick and tired of being sick and tired of Satan winning. Yeah. I am sick and tired. I've had it up to here. Either we are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ or we're not. I, I believe we are coming to a moment, just like in Elijah's day, where he called together the prophets of Baal, and he said, if Baal be God, we're going to worship him, but if God is God, we're going to worship him. So let the God who answers by fire, let him be God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'm here to tell you we serve the God who answers by fire. He still pours out the Holy Spirit on the hungry. He still is a consuming fire. And his word is like a fire and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Hallelujah. Sick and tired. 
It is time that we claim the victory that's already been won. I want to let you in on it. And if there's any contrary spirits listening here or listening through the internet, I want to let them in on it. They are a defeated foe. When Jesus cried, it is finished on Calvary. When he shed his blood, Satan was defeated. The head of the serpent has been crushed under the heel of the Lamb of God. And we have victory every day of our lives. Hear victory their victory, everywhere victory in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Woo, glory. Drive the devil out of your home. That might mean going into your kid's bedroom, pulling some things off the wall. Oh, let's not do that. Let's not get too radical. Why? The devil's crowd is radical. If we don't evangelize our kids, I guarantee you they will. I guarantee you the Wiccan will. I guarantee you that the lost crowd will. I guarantee you that the drug pusher will. I guarantee you that the alcoholic will. If we don't evangelize our kids, who will? We have the truth. We have the well of living water, and we can go and drink to the full. Hallelujah. Now... Let me just warn you, this ain't for the faint of heart. I I realize that we live in a day of cultural Christianity where it's something we've grown up with and we want to go to church to to salve our conscience and make us feel good, but we don't want it to change our lives. God is not in that business. God is not a million miles from that. God wants to reach in. He wants to reach way down low when we're at the depths of depravity and sin, when we can't save ourselves. Lift us up out of the miry clay. Set our feet on a rock to stay. Radically change our lives. He wants to radically change your life and my life and my kids' life. And oh, that I'm not standing in the way of them coming to the fountain of living water. Fight for your families. It's not for the faint of heart. It requires faith and courage. To the fathers, the hymn writer said, ye that are men now serve him. It's time for the men of God to be men of God. And the women of God to be women of God. It's time for the church of the living God to be the church. Because when Jesus comes again, he's coming for a bride without spot and without blemish. He's not coming for one that has prostituted themselves with the world. He is coming for a spotless bride. And and Lord knows, I'm only going to be fully spotless when I'm with Jesus and I'm like him and I see him face to face. But I don't want there to be any question as to which side of this fight I'm on. It's not liberal versus conservative. It, it, it's not rich versus poor. The, fi- the real battle is saved versus lost, light versus darkness, right versus wrong. And it's high time that we get on the side of the right and we hold fast to the right again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Fight for your families. Fight for your children by blessing them and training them. Moses said this in his farewell address. In Deuteronomy 30, 19, and 20, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live that thou mayest love the Lord thy God and that thou mayest obey his voice and that thou mayest cleave unto him for he is thy life and the length of thy days. Oh, that we could get a hold of that. That God is our life and the length of our days. We spend so much time, Brother Derek, trying to hold on to this thing we call life. And we end up squeezing the life out of what we have and what our kids have. 
when if we would just release it to God and we just bow the knee to him and we just surrender to him and say, I'm gonna choose life according to your word and I'm gonna be a blessing to my family and a blessing to my children and I'm gonna, try, and I'm gonna do all I can to get them to Jesus and get them to the foot of the cross so they can choose life too. Oh, that how God would do in an instant and in a second so much more than we could ever ask or imagine. Hallelujah. That thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob to give them. Now life there indicates movement. God hasn't called us to sit, to sit idly by. He has called us to run to the battle. He has called us for such a time as this. And if we don't do it, he'll raise up, he, he can even raise up rocks to give him praise. If we don't do what we're supposed to do, he, he will go up the road and do it somewhere else. He will have a remnant and he will get praise and glory in the earth. But I want to be part of that remnant and I want to be one that's giving him praise and glory. And I want my kids to, I, I, I make no bones about it. I talk to so many parents as a pastor. When their kid starts asking questions about what it means to be saved and they start showing signs that the Holy Spirit is starting to convict them. And so many parents say, well, I'm just not going to force them. I'm not going to push them. I, I'm going to leave that decision up to them. Ultimately, it is their decision whether they're going to follow Jesus or not, but you and I can do all we can to, to make it salty enough where they get thirsty enough where they go to the well of living water and drink. Hallelujah. Life is movement, and blessing means to move toward to add value, whereas cursing is moving away. When it comes to our children, how often are we cursing instead of blessing because we're instead of moving toward them to, to, to sow good seeds into their life and to sow the word of God in their life, instead we're moving away. Instead we're just sitting idly by while the devil just comes in and has a field day. Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. What am I saying? I'm saying as fathers, we need to learn to speak life and not death to our children. We're not to discourage them. We are to train them. We're not to hinder the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. We're to foster the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. We're to move toward them, to bless them according to the word of God, to speak good things into their life. How many children do I come in contact with each year? at the middle school who's been told all their life, you can't do this. You're dumb, you're stupid. May we not be those people. May we be the people that say, with God all things are possible. If God can take a man like D.L. Moody who had just a sixth grade education and shake two continents with the gospel of Jesus Christ, he can do it with any one of us. He's just waiting on some of us to be the people of God and to really believe what he says. Yeah. To do what he says, do. To, to go where he says go. To speak what he says speak. And to keep our mouth shut when he says to keep it shut. Amen. Amen. Call out the seeds of greatness and a future of blessing in your kids. God convicted me a few years back. I got two boys, Andrew and Aaron, 
Andrew's in college now. Aaron's a sophomore in high school. But he convicted me about this, that I need to be telling them every day, you're a man of God. Even when they don't believe it. Even when I don't believe it. Amen. It, even if I can't see it right now in their life. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. By faith, the elders obtained a good report. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And I am to speak into their life. And I'm to speak to them and tell them, according to the word of God, you're a man of God. You're going to be used of God in a great way. God is going to use you to be a husband and a father to the next generation. He's going to use you to do his work in, his gener in your generation, just as he did David in the Old Testament. He's going to use you to rebuild the to rebuild the the sac, the tabernacle of praise he's going to use you to offer sacrifices of praise to him he's going to use you to speak his glorious gospel in the world and see the lost turn to Christ in your generation in your day and time it's time that we call out the called those that God is speaking to in their life i believe someone in this room god's calling you to go to the harvest field. He's calling you to the mission field. He's calling you to preach. He's calling you to be a witness at your school. He's calling you. You are a man or a woman of God and you will do great things for his glory. Hallelujah. Yeah. Fight for our children and fight for our houses and homes. How do we do that? I believe we got to be different than the world. Husbands, love your wives and leave your neighbors alone. Amen. <laughs> Make it your priority to get your family saved. Heard my dad preach. I'm a third generation Baptist preacher, but don't hold that against me. I'm saved and I'm a Christian first and foremost. Because Baptists ain't going to get nobody there. But just from, so you know where I'm coming from, my granddaddy was a Baptist preacher. Went to one too many business meetings and ended up quitting the ministry. <laughs> my dad's a Baptist preacher and dad's gone through a really hard time. My sister passed away two years ago with ALS and dad went through a really hard time. But he's been preaching lately. And son, last Sunday, he preached at the Pleasant View Baptist Church in Woodbury, Tennessee. And I was watching him preach, and he told an old story about one of my best friends growing up was a young man named Matt Allen. And we were both real little at the time when I knew him. But his dad, Bruce, got a burden for his two boys, Mark and Matt. He called up my dad one night and he said, Brother Terry, I'm burdened about my sons. They're getting of age where they need to make a commitment to Christ. And he said, Matt, my youngest one, he's asking questions and he's real sensitive, but I'm afraid he's too young. And Mark, my teenager, he acts like he don't even care. And dad said to him, he said, well, have you ever told them what Jesus means to you? Yeah. And he said, no, Brother Terry, I really haven't. He said, well, start there. Bruce went home. He told his two boys, Mark and Matt, about Jesus. The next Sunday night at the church, when they gave the invitation, not only was Matt at the front getting saved, but Mark was too. I wonder who might get saved in our homes if we told our children what Jesus meant to us. If we showed them what it means to live a life committed to Christ against all odds, even though the deck is stacked against us. The, de the deck's always been stacked against us, by the way. They've never really been for Jesus Christ. But greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Amen. I wonder if your 
sons and daughters might get saved. If you really, with a broken heart and the love of Jesus in your heart, told them what Jesus means to you. We were the same at home as we are at church. Or sometimes that can be a problem too, but that's another sermon for another night, brother. <laughs> if we lived out this thing called Christianity, I shared last night, I believe it more and more every day. The more I'm around young people, and, and I'm old enough now to not be a young person anymore, I'm pushing in on 50. And, but the more I'm around young people, this generation is not impressed with the things we thought would impress them. They can get better entertainment from Disney World. We're not in the entertainment business. We are in the soul-saving business. We are in the life-changing business. And life change happens whenever we read this book and we get on fire for God and we let the Holy Spirit have his way in our lives and we start to walk out and flesh out in our lives what we read in here. Amen. What they're looking for is authenticity. That's exactly right. And that starts with us as parents that we live out an authentic Christian life in front of them. That it's not just shouting on Sunday Come on. and then doing another kind of shouting at mama throughout the week. But it's living out a life of surrender to Jesus. Yes. He, as we say, he is worthy of it all. Lead by example. Surrender to God, be full of his spirit. Well, I got the Holy Spirit when I got saved. Yeah, we get the earnest money of the Holy Spirit, but he can get a whole lot more of us than we're willing to give him. And it's one thing to have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us and another thing for the Holy Spirit to come upon us in a powerful way and use us to do great exploits for his kingdom in the world. May we be full to overflowing of the Spirit. Yes. May we learn to pray for and with our spouse and children yes. and family. Even as a preacher, I'm, I'm, I'll just be transparent tonight. Even as a preacher, sometimes that's the hardest thing to do. We stand and preach the Word of God. We know God called us. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt God called me to preach when I was 15 years old in Rayon City, Tennessee. Woke me up in the middle of the night, told me, preach the word. And I ain't got over it. And I ain't quit. Sometimes it is so hard at home because they see us at our worst. But that doesn't relieve us of our responsibility to be men of God and to lead our families in the ways of righteousness. What am I saying? Our families are worth fighting for. Yes. Your family and my family are worth fighting for. And Lord knows our families need someone to fight for them. Our children need someone to fight for them, not with them. May we commit to fight for our families by loving and leading them to Jesus. I want everyone to bow your head and close your eyes. Right now, I believe God's speaking. And I'm going to ask fathers to lead the way tonight. I'm going to ask you to come to this altar and let's pray together for our families. Fathers, lead the way. Let's pray. May God make us men of God. Men, ladies, if you would join them, pray for your husband. Pray for your children. Pray for your grandchildren. May we commit to fight for them. Just as we've been singing tonight, Lord, we need you. More than we need a better job, we need Jesus. More than we need more talent, we need Jesus. Lord, our families are in trouble. 
But Lord, I thank you that you specialize in hard cases. You specialize in doing the impossible. Lord, when the doctor has said there's nothing else I can do, we know a great physician that can do even more. Lord, we know if you can bring healing to our physical bodies, you can bring healing to our homes. Lord, as you begin to heal our homes, we know you're gonna heal our communities and heal our churches. Lord, we long for you to heal our land. Our land is divided and Lord, we're divided over all the wrong things. Lord, we ask for you to bring healing to the body of Christ. We ask for you to bring healing, Lord, that we might be one as you and the Father are one so that the world will know that the Father sent you. Lord, that we might be one in our homes, completely surrendered and devoted to Jesus Christ. May we join with Joshua tonight in saying, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose today who you're going to serve, but as for this household, we're going to serve the Lord. Lord, revive our hearts. Fill us afresh and anew with your Holy Spirit. Help us do what we can't do. Lord, we pray for our children that are lost or may be backslidden, may have even committed sin today that we don't know about. We pray you draw them back to yourself. You'd send your spirit to where they are and convict them of their need for Jesus. It's in his name we pray.